All right, this is the psychosis series. And in this series of videos, we're gonna be taking a deeper look at psychosis. And I personally have never really seen a great definition of psychosis. I've seen some people say it's being out of touch with reality, which in my opinion is really too vague to mean anything. And I've also seen people use the schizophrenia criteria saying it's delusions, hallucinations, or disorganized behavior. But I hope in this series of videos, you're gonna have a better grasp of what psychosis is and what's going on when it occurs. And I'll be presenting a cognitive model of psychosis in these videos. And this model reminds me of evolution in that behind this model or theory that is really complex, there's a deceptively simple idea that once you grasp, you understand what's going on much better and you see it everywhere you go. And I'll be taking my ideas from a few sources. There's a few papers by Corlett, Frith, and Fletcher on computational psychiatry and the Bayesian framework for psychosis. Don't get caught up on the fancy words. This isn't that difficult to grasp. There's also a paper by Kapur, which is psychosis as a state of aberrant salience, which I'll be drawing from. And a lot of my ideas I'll be taking from and directly stealing from Slate Star Codex. It's a blog that's now called Astral Codex 10. And I'll be listing all these papers in the description below. So to understand psychosis, first you have to have a better idea of what's going on with perception when things are acting properly. And to do that, I'll have to explain predictive processing, which is a model which explains how we make sense of incomprehensible sense data to make a meaningful picture of the world. And after saying that sentence, I realize how ridiculous it sounds. It sounds like something someone who is trying to be much smarter than they actually are would say. Uh-oh. I want you to consider for a second the sense data that that retina receives before perception takes place. So consider there, there would be blood vessels, there would be a big blind spot where the optic nerve leaves for the brain. There would be a crazy distortion of, of light and dark pixels. Everything would be two dimensions. But because of perception, we get this really nice, easy, pretty picture in our brain. Just consider all the things that our brain has to process. It has to process shadows, it has to process dimensionality, and you automatically process that it was clouds and, and sky that was above. So our brain is able to unconsciously process all these things. It's able to infer the sources, the light, and deduce the shape, opacity, and illuminance of the objects to make sense of these pictures. And this is all done by predictive processing. So I'm gonna be going over how predictive processing works, which will give us the first clues of what goes wrong when psychology psychosis occurs. So the key insight to understand this is that the brain is a multi-layer prediction machine. So neural processing consists of two streams. There's the top down stream and the bottom up stream. And the top down stream is the stream of predictions that are based on our models of the world. So our reality of the world is a handshake between our top down models of the world and the bottom up sensations. And one little trick I use to remember top down and bottom up is picturing our nervous system. So top down is our predictions. So I kind of think of our brain because that's where the models exist. And then bottom up is our sensations. So I picture our body because that's where the sensations sensations come from. So both streams are probabilistic in nature. So bottom-up has to deal with fog and static and darkness and neural noise and a bunch of things that make it difficult to process. And then the top downstream knows that predicting the future is inherently difficult, so the models might be flawed. So both streams contain not only the data, but also estimates of the precision of that data. But consider if it was a really hot day and that caused the light to be refracted and that caused the mirage. And it's a common theme in cartoons and stuff for mirages to cause hallucinations, like when people who are really thirsty see water. So that's an example of bottom-up data being less clear and being labeled as very low precision. So let me do a quick demonstration of how top-down hypotheses work to make sense of bottom-up data. So take a second and take a look at these pictures. Do they make sense to you? So now you can see that the top is a lovely little cow and the bottom is a Dalmatian. But when I remove the visual aid, the top still looks like a cow and the bottom still looks like a Dalmatian. So once I give you the top-down model, you see the pictures. So according to the predictive processing model, this is how we perceive things all the time. So like I said, I like to think of the decision that the top-down and bottom-up processes make is sort of like an agreement where they have a handshake and say, all right, you're this confident and I'm this confident. Let's, let's make an agreement and we'll decide on this. So let's imagine scenario one, and that's the sense data matches the prediction. And that's the example of the road. There's nothing particularly contentious from the visual data. And our brain is able to make easy sense of it. So read to yourself what's in the triangle. I'll give you a second. So what the triangle actually says is I love Paris in the the springtime. So this is an example of our top-down stream ability to cook the books and alter what we perceive. So it replaces the bottom-up stream, which is perceiving the two does, and makes it so that the sentence is coherent and we don't even see that there's two does. Now, scenario three is a little more complicated. I'm going to go into more detail in it, but it occurs when there's an unresolvable conflict between high precision sense data and predictions. And the higher the degree of the mismatch and the higher the supposed precision of the data that led to the mismatch, the more surprising 
that will occur and the louder the alarm will be that will be sent to the brain. So this surprisal will cause our brain to reconsider its models. So it will either change the parameters of the models or will create new models until the surprise decreases. And this scenario is at the heart of psychosis and I breezed through it incredibly fast. So I'm gonna go through it again, but much slower and through each little detail. So imagine you're going for a hike in the woods and it's your first time going for a hike in a really long time and you come across this. So imagine you freak out because your brain processes this curved objects as a snake. So you think you're in a lot of danger. So first let's go through what happens during the handshake. So your brain asks how similar are my predictions and what I'm experiencing in reality. So the top-down models predict that curved things in trees are snakes and thus are dangerous. So clearly we have an unresolvable conflict. So we move on to the next step and our brain asks how confident are you that these things aren't similar? So here the different sources of evidence are weighted by their precision, and the more precise the evidence is given a greater weight. So because this is an unresolvable conflict between high precision sense data and prediction, our brain registers surprise. And this is where Bayes' theorem comes into play for this model, and I don't want you to get too wrapped up into Bayes' theorem for this because I don't want it to get more confusing than it needs to be. But it's basically a way to up update a model based on new evidence. So for here, basically what it's doing is it's updating our model, which says that curved things in trees are snakes and are dangerous. And it's adding this new data that we came across a curved thing in a tree that wasn't dangerous. So to summarize, our brain experienced this mismatch between expecting a snake and experiencing a stick. So it sent off a alarm bell saying that we're really sure that this stick is not a snake. And we updated our models that we don't always need to to be scared when we come across a curved thing in a tree because sometimes curved things in trees are just sticks. So our brain was able to resolve the alarm bell by updating our predictions of the world. It updated the fact that curved things in trees can be dangerous and they can also be not dangerous. So my last example was of course a simplified example of how this occurs in our brain. And the main thing I left out is that this occurs in a hierarchical fashion. So to understand what I mean by this occurs in a hierarchical fashion, consider the steps it takes to even understand reading a sentence. And then your brain takes these shapes and it makes letters and then it takes these letters and makes words and then takes these words and makes sentences. And then it takes these sentences and is able to apply abstract ideas to understand these sentences. So these handshakes occur at every single level. So the lower levels shoot up the sense data to the higher levels, which adjust their hypotheses and they bring them down to the lower levels. So my previous example of showing the I love Paris in the springtime triangle, here we see the handshake resolved at the words and sentence handshake. So our brain smooths over the sentence to remove the two does. And then when it's sent higher up in the hierarchy, there's no real surprise being registered because the surprise was resolved at that level. And now here's another example that occurs at the graphic shape and letter level. So here, when you read these two words, you read it as the cat but consider the fact that the H and the and the A and T are the exact same shape. Your brain is able to use its models to predict that in the first word, it's an H for the, and in the second word, it's an A for cat. So to summarize, the top down and bottom up streams move through the brain side by side and interface with each other. And each level receives the predictions from the level above it and the sense data from the level below it. And Bayes' theorem is just a way of expressing how much our belief should change given the new evidence available. So now that we have a better understanding of what predictive processing is, we can better understand psychosis by understanding where this goes awry. So I wouldn't stress if there was anything that you didn't really understand here or didn't make a ton of sense. The goal for this video is not for you to understand exactly how these things work, but just to get a feel for what's going on with predictive processing. So I just wanna encourage you to keep going even if you feel confused or a little bit lost, because I think once you see how this applies to psychosis, you'll just intuitively understand this video.